My name is Milton Washington. I am 52 years old officially. I live here in New York, Harlem. I was born somewhere in Korea, but I'm not sure exactly where. But my first uh, earliest childhood memories were um, in some Korean village, um, I think near Incheon. Life was very interesting for me in Korea as a black kid um, in South Korea um, it, because uh, you know, because of the rejection and isolation. You know, I think every kid just wants to be a part. You know, they want to be able to be a kid. They want to be able to run around and play and be accepted and, and, and even when they're not accepted, fight and play again and be accepted, you know, all that. I didn't have that because, uh, you know, I was, you know, as I, as I tell folks, I was a little black monkey of the Korean village. You know, I'll never forget the song that they used to sing to me. Um, it rejected me, but fortunately, I was hyper aware of myself. And that was probably the beginnings of uh, me asking about my father. As I'm walking around South Korea in the isolation that I had, I only had a mother, so it was hard for me not to wonder about my father. And my mother didn't look like me, so maybe my father did. But it was hard for, e for me to even imagine because as I looked at my skin, I didn't even know what this meant. In my mind, I go, okay, my mother doesn't look like me. I don't look like everybody else here. So, you know, that process of deduction was like, maybe I look like my father. And so to me, it's not a surprise for me to know that that years later from that point, you know, I'm four or five years old in the village. And then when I got adopted at the age of eight, I got adopted from an orphanage called St. Vincent's Orphanage for Amerasians or Father Keene's house that when the Washingtons showed up that day and Captain Don Washington stepped out of the driver's seat of that car, I was convinced he was my father because that's exactly what I had imagined my father to look like. So it just kind of made sense to me. About the age of six, my mother and I moved from uh, Dongducheon uh, to Bupyeong. And we moved to Dongducheon uh, when I was about five. And we moved there because we got kicked out of the village. And we got kicked out of the village because of me. Um, uh, of my mother having a black kid and bringing shame onto the village. And then I think we moved to Dongducheon because I think that's where my mother's from. Because that's also where my grandmother was. And I write about, uh, in the book that I'm writing, I write about that chapter in which um, I'm with, uh, having dinner with my grandmother, my mother, and my sister, an older sister, um, who I remember from time to time. She, we didn't live together, but she's the older sister that I got reunited with just recently, who lived in Seattle, who was taking care of our mother before she passed eight years ago. So then only living uh, about a year in Dongachan and moving to Bupyeong, uh, first of all, we lived across the street from the front gates of Camp Market, the large uh, military base, logistics um, and maintenance base that supported much of the uh, U.S. Armed Forces um, in South Korea, um, close to the DMZ. Right at the front gates, my mother and I moved to a studio apartment that was uh, right uh, on top of a 24-hour porridge house that was at the mouth of the red light district that I, I call T-Shirt Alley. I call it T-shirt alley because that's what a lot of Koreans called Americans, T-shirts, because they wore T-shirts, soldiers. So uh, here we were uh, in this apartment at the mouth of the red light district. Then I find out, you know, as my mother spends so much of her time away, I find out exactly where she's working. She's working at an all black club. And even though this was, you know, 74, 75, um, and the military, U.S. military, was desegregated in 52. Soldiers had to kind of play off base separately. I mean, when I say play, the play was the sex. And the U.S. military had um, unwritten rules of conduct um, and the terms of engagement for that sex. White soldiers only had to deal with prostitutes who only served white soldiers. And black soldiers only had to deal with prostitutes who dealt with only black soldiers. Even if um, uh, that woman was walking about town or walking about the red light district, she had to make herself aesthetically obvious to the soldiers she served. 
which is one of the reasons why when we moved into town, I saw my mother slowly uh, kind of transform herself from having straight hair, kind of look like a standard Korean, to this kind of an Afro. I didn't know what the hell an Afro was, but I knew my mother's hair looked different than anybody else's. And I didn't know it at the time, but she started to kind of transform into a black woman. Because those were the rules. Not only did my mother have, because she was a boss, she was a mama son, she'd have meetings in our apartment, you know, with her 13, 15 girls. So I saw that facet of it, but then I also saw the facet of it that, you know, every once in a while, my mother, you know, like I was supposed to be asleep on the floor of our studio apartment, um, and then my mother would bring up a soldier. It wasn't in the context of like, you know, I never saw money transacting and all that. I, I didn't have that capacity to understand that, but I knew these were different men, you know? Um, and not only did I know that they were different men, I saw all my, mother, my, all my mother's girls with different men. I had this notion that there was sex um, and it was, you know, kind of almost indiscriminate. It was a lot of it. So I was in that culture, I saw it, um, even to the point in which uh, uh, I saw my mother, her club getting raided by the police because of the sex. My mother gets uh, uh, um, arrested along with her girls. She gets locked up and put in jail for you know a week or two at a time. And my mother screaming out to me saying, stay home, don't go anywhere, um, unsook downstairs, she's gonna give you food, the porridge house. And I'm crying and wondering where she is. But then when she's gone, I'm like, oh, I got a holiday. I got a holiday from all the rules. I can run the streets as much as I want to. Yeah, it's bad that my mother got locked up and now she's away, but it's great because she was always kind of hard on me anyway with all the rules. Now I got some freedom. And I always believed my mother. Whatever she said, and when she said she was going to be back, she always proved it. So I saw that culture of sex and kind of prostitution even before I knew what it was, but I knew what it was. I knew it wasn't the standard thing. And I knew that, that those activities were still kind of putting my mother on the margins of society because I saw the way that, you know, kind of, you know, common folks looked at her. And I knew that it wasn't necessarily good, but I didn't care because I absolutely knew my mother loved me. And she was hard on me. She would beat my butt for the slightest thing. But after that beating, she'd let me, you know, crawl up into her, her arms and her seat and she would explain to me why it has to be like this and how this world is not friendly to her and it's not friendly to me because of who we are and how we have to have each other's back. In terms of why she chose to give me up at that moment is still a mystery. I don't have all the answers to that. But what I do know is this, most mothers in those situations um, relinquish their children basically around birth. That's the critical mass of kids that are put up for adoption. You know, the given is the environment, you know, third world status of South Korea in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and kind of what the war has done um, and the poverty uh, uh, mothers having to make decisions on, hey, I got three kids, I can only afford one. After that, most of the kids are given up before the age of six. And the reason six is an important number is because many mothers, especially with mixed race babies, are getting subsidies from the state until the age of six. So uh, many adoptees, Korean adoptees, mixed race Korean adoptees, that are given up at a later age, they're given up at the age of six. But yet my mother kept me until eight. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, because I've been asked this question um, before, this is kind of what I think happened. You know, and this is kind of in line with some of the things that I remember about our lives then, and also in line with um, what I've researched. So my mother had three other Korean kids they were born in 55, 56, and 65. Tong, the sister I remember, was the one born in 55. Those three daughters were living away from my mother and I. I would see my sister, Tong, when we go to my grandmother's. Then there was me, 
And then there was a younger black Korean sister named Edie. Why did my mother give me up at the age of eight? Uh, my mother was in the game. She was a mama son. I just think that it became too overwhelming, too much of a responsibility to have me. And then when you factor that in with, you know, there are no more subsidies and, you know, uh, I'm restrictive for her to living a kind of a freer life to be able to do her work. And maybe this is just me, but I think that she knew um, the kind of son she had. I think she knew that I would find my way. So at the age of eight, um, uh, my mother, and I write that chapter uh, about her dropping me off at, at that orphanage, Father Keene's house. Um, and how everything was different that day. Her attitude was different. Her mood was different. She was quiet in the taxi. She was short with me to get my clothes on, to take me to the orphanage. Um, she almost seemed to be angry. And when we pulled up to this orphanage, I saw all these mixed kids. I was just like, whoa. First of all, they look a lot like me. This is interesting. Um, and my mother said, hey, uh, I'm gonna be back tomorrow. Um, to check on you, um, do you need anything? And, and, and again, that was different. She had never asked me about that. And so she drops me off at this orphanage. And by the way, she does come the next day. Um, and that was the last day I saw her. I was at that orphanage um, probably uh, for several weeks. Um, I made friends, uh, but one of the enemies that I had made that kind of slowly turned into a friend was this kid named Joseph. Um, I was eight years old, he was 10 years old, um, black and Korean. There were times in which uh, families, American families would come to kind of take kids home. It's like auditing kids, like, oh, is this kid good for us and our family? Let's take them home for a few days and see how it works out, see how, it, see how they fit in. And so one day, the, uh, I'm on that bicycle and we're playing around at the orphanage and this big black car pulls up this man pops out, this soldier, black American soldier that, again, looked like a superhero. He had the square jaw, really strong and big and powerful looking. And I was like, oh my God, that's got to be my dad. And then out of the passenger side, this, you know, I'd never seen a black woman, but I saw a woman come out with this afro and this, this dress she was gorgeous. And not only was she gorgeous, but just this really kind and loving spirit. And I was just like, I think I've just found my parents. They came out to actually pick up Joseph because um, I didn't know it at the time, but they had been adopting him for over a year. The adoption finally went through um, and they came to pick him up or the adoption didn't go through, but it was on the cusp of going through. They came to pick him up to try him out with the family. So when they come out to get Joseph, um, I run in the car, wouldn't get out. Then they decided to take us both home to see which kid fits better with the family. And the Washingtons make a decision to say, hey, we're gonna take both of these kids. And that's how Joseph became my brother. That's how the Washingtons became my parents. And, and my brothers and sisters became my brothers and sisters. There's a story behind everybody, everybody. As an adult, especially me researching all that I have researched for my story, you know, my heart goes out for all people around the world who are having to do things that they would not normally do, you know, because, uh, you know, the geopolitical forces at play with South Korea at the time needing U.S. dollars and the Korean prostitute being the number one earner of US dollars. How could I look at my mother and feel some kind of way about what she did? And how could I look at my mother objectively and go, you know, she did, she used what she had to be a good mother to me. How could I not come to that conclusion? And if, and if that applies to my mother, I bet you there's a story with everybody that's in these situations. I know it is, and I know it's a story that's oftentimes heartbreaking and inspiring at the same time, because that person who's out on the street that's down and out, yeah, 
They may be out on the street, down and out, but they're still, they're still fighting because they could choose to end it. But yet they still persist. And I love that story of persistence. I love it because I think it's fundamental to who and what I am. My name is Milton Washington, and this is my Korean American story.